flags are blowing in the breeze and someone's praying on their gun. You can kick and you can scream, they're coming for your own last son. So hold, hold me down. Syndicate you double speak and confiscate that cell phone. Teach your peasants to repeat, sit down all over, throw a tree. People die in files, delete your master's hold is now complete. So Hey, <clears throat> this is Alan Mearns here. <clears throat> I'm just going to give you a wee tutorial over that Yes the Raven song, uh, Breathe. It's just from my first album, uh, Love is Covered in Dust. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to use this song to talk about some of the techniques involved and uh, learn a few things, maybe musical things too. So let's just go through it sec section by section. <clears throat> Well, first we'll talk about the texture um, and the technique that we're using. It's maybe a wee bit more advanced finger style thing than the basic stuff I've covered in those early tutorials. <coughs> Excuse me. Didn't sleep very well. Um, the, uh, the general kind of idea with this is kind of a back and forth thing. Um, but instead of kind of doing something that's just a broken up chord, like it's more of a kind of a little bit of a sinister um, staying on one bass note as a repeated um, thing, which is a good idea um, if it if it's connected to the melody. Um, so what I'm doing with this uh, song, I do this quite a lot, is actually play the thing that I'm singing and then slightly vary the thing that's on the guitar so it has kind of a counter melody. <coughs> so on the, uh, the intro part, um, I kind of play a version of the verse melody and with a slight uh, twist to it, um, it's got kind of a Phrygian uh, sound in the intro. And if you don't know what that is, uh, the Phrygian mode is essentially just a minor scale with the second note of the scale flattened. So instead of this, it's uh, <clears throat> so um, it starts off like this with this little bit of a kind of a kind of a pedal point uh, riff that you may have think of here and maybe in Bach or something like that like something like a 
this kind of thing. So it goes. So you hear that kind of um, flattened second there, which gives it a slightly kind of um, Middle Eastern quality or uh, Spanish quality, perhaps. That's what we're used to hearing that mode from. Um, so, and you can see that I'm keeping my thumb going like almost robotically. And you'll also notice that the melodic material that I'm doing is um, happening on the upstroke or the on the upbeat, which coincide. Um, this is a very important thing to um, kind of get in a lot of just nearly all pop music and blues as well, especially kind of finger style type blues, is that the melody exists, um, melodic material usually exists on the upbeat. And it's not like an, an, a stressed upbeat like we think of, you know, with like reggae or something, like chink, chink, chink. It's, it's this kind of... Um, it's almost, it sounds weird, but it's almost like a very lazy downbeat. <laughs> no, it sounds contradictory. But a lot of pop music just it emphasizes the upbeat. And we're so used to it that um, it becomes normal. Uh, it usually freaks out um, classical musicians if they have to go in and play on a pop score. And they're constantly seeing all these upbeats and ties over the bar. But if we just think of a, of a famous song like um, like Here Comes the Sun, right? Um, I'm not even sure how that goes. I'll do it in D. Here comes the sun Here comes the sun And I say it's alright So do you see how that whole melody is being kind of emphasized on the upbeat, but it sounds totally natural. Here comes the sun, here comes the sun, and I say it's all right, it's all right, you know. So upbeats sound relaxed, upbeats sound just chilled, and uh, if that's one, one thing that the Beatles do actually, that's very strange whenever they don't play and emphasize upbeats and they emphasize downbeats something we're only used to hearing in you know like classical music it sounds a little bit, a little bit sinister you know um, so when you hear them doing these chord progressions like It's kind of to do with their kind of, ding, 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 you know, their uh, brass band kind of northern thing going on there. But it, it it sounds very kind of strange and sinister. So whenever you're doing a, a finger picking pattern like this, it, it gives you an opportunity to very naturally have a back and forth thing with your thumb and some kind of melodic material with your fingers. And uh, that's the way you kind of want it anyway. And so you're not having to simultaneously do a lot of stuff with your thumb and fingers, which is exactly what you want. You want this kind of um, strumming motion, this kind of back and forth thing going. So that's a very long-winded waffle about that. But I'll just play it again just to get the idea of this, this thumb being on the downbeat and it being kind of the, the sinister kind of landscape for the stuff that's going to be um, sung and played. Now another technical thing that I want you to uh, that pervades throughout the song is an idea that I use when I'm doing uh, my own Yes the Raven stuff when I'm doing uh, Irish music with the Belfast Boys um, or if I'm actually playing classical guitar and I'm doing styles that would um, benefit from this is this idea of playing uh, legato or connected smooth you know which is a very difficult thing to do on the guitar. Okay, so legato is just a fancy kind of uh, fancy pants classical word that means connected. 
and you know kind of smooth we're used to thinking about legato like in in shreddy guitar like uh you know doing a lot of hammer-ons and tapping you know tony mcalpine versus Ingve momstein <laughs> tapping into my childhood here so when I talk about legato here on finger style guitar, what I'm talking about is trying to connect the notes from one note to the next without a kind of an unnecessary separation. Um, so instead of just going like this, um, that doesn't really have much of an atmosphere to it. Um, what I'm trying to get into with the guitar is it's more kind of ancient harp-like origins, you know? That's what the sound that I like. Um, so it's a little bit of a stretch to do that, but what I'm doing is I'm playing the C on the first string and then I'm reaching all the way to the B on the second string. And then I'm, I'm able to keep that C going as the pedal point to the lick. Do you hear that? clash. Now the guitar can get away with this. This is one of the beautiful things about the guitar um, in any style, I think. Because the note decays so quickly, which would be thought of as kind of its weakness, each note decays so quickly like this autumn leaf. But because of that, when we play another note that kind of contrasts or even clashes with it, it's usually not unbearably unpleasant, like it would be maybe on the piano or an organ or something where the notes just hold on longer. So um, when I do this little pattern here, the whole time I'm le letting this C ring out and clash or complement the notes that are peeling downwards in the pedal point lick. So as opposed to, which doesn't have much to it. See now it's given a sense of kind of mystery and wonder. And really exploiting the guitar for what it can do. Um, it's also a little, maybe a bit of an unusual technique for you. Um, and it's a little bit unusual for the left hand too, what I'm doing. Um, and I do this all the time in classical guitar we're used to always kind of doing our fingering like this, right? Like if there's a note on the same uh, fret or else we do a wee bar. <clears throat> but because I want to keep this C going really strongly and nicely, um, it's important that you kind of keep your alignment. And I'm actually doing like a, an opposite kind of crossover fingering here. So my second finger is going in front of the first finger on the G underneath the C. That's because I don't want to get tied down in a bar. I don't want to... And then kind of have to get out of a bar. Bars can be very useful, especially little mini bars. Um, but you don't want to get stuck in a bar. You want to try and remain on your feet. It's a wee bit like when you're playing football. And by football, I mean uh, soccer for you Americans. If you're defending somebody and you're uh, prone to just want to do slide tackles all the time, you're going to be a bit of a useless defender. When you're, You want to stay on your feet when you're defending somebody. If you slide tackle, your arse is on the ground and you're kind of useless. You have to jump back up and get up. And uh, you want, So when you're defending somebody, you want to kind of stay on your feet and follow them and run with them um, if you're playing at a high level. You only slide tackle in kind of desperate measures. So bars can be a wee bit like a slide tackle. Um, when you're doing a bar, it's hard to kind of just jump back out of it. So that's the reason why I do that odd fingering here. Over fingering, so then um, kind of, you know, so I'm kind of step stone, you know, taking stepping stones across the river, careful. Um, so I can make the next thing as easy as possible and so it'll definitely happen.
And here's the next thing about this legato plan is um, it's a little bit of the opposite idea that a lot of jazz players have to where they don't, uh, because they want to play in a patterned way, which is completely understandable, they want to make every scale and chord be useful in every single key. A lot of jazz players will kind of uh, avoid using the open strings as options because if you include the open strings or you know you can't use that chord shape in a, in a key that doesn't have the open string or that scale shape now this kind of style that I play is kind of the exact opposite of that um, if you're trying to play like really connected with this harp like guitar you want to you want to be always wary of where you've got open string possibilities and that includes classical guitar um, this folk stuff that I do and the Irish music I do. Um, so you want to um, be aware when you have an open string possibility because that has that lovely um, connectedness but it also allows you to move somewhere else. Because when you play an open string it's going to ring and your left hand is obviously free to access the next point you need to get at. So when I get down to this uh, riff here. I'm on an F here on the third string and then the next pedal point is going to start on the open E. So I'm able to play this F and then get off the C pedal point and then start the open E thing transition. So it has it everything is connected to the next note. for the intro but these are a kind of advanced things I'm sorry I have to talk about them um, so you can understand them so the verse is a bit more simple um, I'm kind of doing the same thing um, I only uh, to start with I essentially play what I'm singing now this is a great thing to do if you're like it's just you and a guitar or you and in any instrument um, you've probably heard the term less is more, less is more, um, which is kind of a roundabout way of saying focus on the essential thing. Um, a lot of times just big clunky chords um, don't give the listener that much to hold on to. Sometimes it's better to just play a drone note and then play exactly the notes that you're singing if the melody is, you know, it moves and has an implied harmony to it. Just If you just play exactly what you're singing, sometimes that'll sound much bigger than, you know, kind of contradicting what you're singing, if you know what I mean. And you hear this a lot um, when you hear, uh, if, I, if I was in like an electric trio, which is essentially like, you know, like Led Zeppelin, for instance, you know, the singer's not playing anything. And you think of their heaviest riffs where they, the bass and the guitar essentially connect and play the same thing, right? And it just sounds like this devastating machine. Or uh, even a recent band like uh, the Royal Blood band where it's just a bass player, but then he uses an octave pedal to sound like there's a guitar and bass playing in unison. And it sounds huge. So you can apply that um, logic to your solo kind of folky stuff as well. If you're singing something that has kind of implied tonality in it, it's not just one note for instance, if you just double that, a lot of times that will sound bigger than if you just play the chords. Okay, And it's also true that if you play something that is linear, that has a linear quality to it and it's not just chords. Lines in music, just like in uh, visual art, just like a line will draw the eye, you know, to itself. Um, a line in music will draw the ear to itself um, much more than just a, a chord, right? That's why that radio head song uh, Street Spirit sounds so cool 
you know, it sounds pretty if you just do the chords, but it's not as special. Like if I play like Rose of Houses all staring down on me. That's a beautiful melody, that's got a lot of beautiful implications and stuff. But then when you get that Ed O'Brien part, this kind of genius part. Um, Rose of Houses all staring down on me. Then it's got this amazing kind of counterpoint. Um, so this is a bit similar in that sense, um, although when I start singing I'm just playing exactly what I'm singing but in this legato style. So it goes, Images that make believe there's something real about this dream. So I just end on that normal A minor chord. And with a little suspension, just to bookend it. Um, so it's a very droney song, almost like Masters of War or um, Working Class Hero. It's almost just set on like a minor chord, and that's the intention to be almost like a cowboy song. So, uh, images that make believe there's something real about this dream. And then the second time, what I do is to um, to create contrast. I essentially do the little pedal point thing that I did as the intro. Um, Things that only I can see the ghost behind the coke machine. Just to make it not exactly the same. So you have to concentrate on your singing a wee bit when you're doing that. You have to almost ignore the thing you're playing on the guitar or you'll be drawn to it and sing out of tune. I might have just sung out of tune, I don't even know. Um, so um, then the only other part about that is uh, um, when I do that we bend just to make it stranger I guess um, things that only I can see the ghost behind the coke machine and then the next part's the, the same and then I do the same trick after that um, flags are blowing in the breeze and someone's praying It's got that just constant um, rhythm going. So uh, then it gets into the, the chorus, um, which is something I try and do in my folk songs, which is maybe a bit unusual. Um, I, I kind of take an idea that's more from uh, pop music and bands and actually try and create a, a chorus, like a real chorus in a folk song. So it's not just a strophic form, it's not just these big stanzas, big verses, like your usual Bob Dylan song or Leonard Cohen song that has just a wee refrain at the end that kind of ties it up like a sonnet. It's more like a, um, a regular song, you know, like a, you know, like a U2 song or a Radiohead song. It has a chorus. Um, so in the chorus, I, I'm taking this pedal point thing, um, this thing that keeps hitting a note and coming back to it and descending stepwise, and then I put it in a slightly different tonal context, which is a little tricky to play. Um, so I'm essentially doing a kind of a C chord, even though it's got this second, which is quite dissonant when you, when you play it by itself, but... <coughs> So, but I'm going to start. So the reason why it's a wee bit tricky is I'm trying to maintain this legato thing still. And I have to reach from my third finger over to the pinky there. And I'm just adding that D to be just an extra buoyant harmony. It's, it's dissonant, but it's, it's just creating a bit more meat to the chord. Um, So I do that one like a C pedal point thing, you know, where, where it's you know it's got a C in the bass, the relative major chord to the usual A minor that we've been in, and so it's this kind of lifting thing, you know, where um, and then it starts on the fifth of the C chord, a G, 
So, so essentially it's going like this if you play it very simply. But that doesn't really sound that great to me, so... So what I can do is I've got this G here, and then I've got this F natural here, and then I've got this open E, and those are all stepwise notes. And this D on the other side. And then the next chord is um, an E minor implication, and I'm doing the same trick in E minor. Obviously it's got an E in the bass, um, which makes it easy all of a sudden. Um, e minor. The sudden drop in the bass also kind of ups the ante a wee bit. Um, so I'm doing the same thing, E minor, fifth of an E minor chord is a B, so it's, it's doing the pedal point uh, descending from the fifth again. It does exactly the same thing on a G chord. Um, it's a great thing about playing fingerstyle guitar, you don't have to play big clunky chords. You can play a G chord just by putting a D down and playing the open G string. You know? right. The only hard part about that is you have to do a wee shift to kind of keep the legato thing going. ready for then the D minor pedal point thing which I'm doing on the third of a D minor chord an F here and then what I do is introduce that Phrygian sound and it turns out being almost like an inverted well actually not almost like an inverted um, B flat major chord which would be the that Phrygian, or in a classical sense, it would be like a Neapolitan chord. I'll maybe talk about that some other time. Right. So the chorus is a series of these kind of pedal point things that kind of raise in intensity, and then when the D minor chord happens, it kind of drops in intensity. So it goes. So, so ho. have that kind of over ringing thing and then you sing some of those notes that you're playing it has this nice mysterious quality to it so when you go and then what I do next is um, a series um, as you play them if you think about them just as intervals and the outro of the chorus. They're kind of, they're like sixths, um, which is a kind of a way of saying like an inverted third. So if we have a normal third as part of a normal minor chord. Um, one, two, three, right? And instead of playing it like that, we take the C and put it on the bottom and then we keep the, the A where it is, that's a sixth, right? It's like a flip third, and it's a wider interval, so it sounds a bit, it's very beautiful in the lower end, because there's more room for the lower notes to inhabit. So it's kind of more of a cellos and violas. So I'm playing these kind of inverted chords in the outro of the chorus. So we have, um, Kind of like an A minor chord here, but not in root positions, so it has more potential emotional energy to it, because it's not as explicit. And then I go like a D minor chord, but that's, you know. And then because of the pattern going to the E, it creates this kind of 
triggers out at this kind of suspension or an appoggiatura. And then this is more of an explicit inversion here of a C major chord. We've got E here, C here, and G here. And then, and then this is like a, a G7 chord with a with a D in the bass with a suspension. Suspension is just when you hold over, you suspend over a note from the previous chord and it's held over as kind of a pleasant tension that eventually hopefully will get released. Um, so it's not a type of chord in itself, it's a function, it's like a harmonic function, like a suspension bridge where the, br the bridge is kind of suspending, you know, um, over a body of water or something. So it's that kind of... I guess there's a kind of a suspense to it as well. Uh, and then on the next chord, there's another suspension. Um, instead of just going to the A minor, I don't give the A note, I play the open B. So it's just another suspension. Now when I'm doing this, it's a bit more of that um, most useful finger picking pattern type stem because I'm alternating my fingers a wee bit more. Um. trick you can do with uh, if your acoustic guitar if the action is not too high or your strings aren't too thick you can give the illusion almost of a, of a Gretschy whammy bar um, you don't have to shake all the notes but sometimes you can just give a wee bit of vibrato on the thinnest string the top fingered uh, string um, I'm, I'm doing that I'm actually avoiding playing the high E string because uh, my ear just wants to hear this voicing. And I'm giving a wee deliberate wiggle to the C here. So it kind of gives you this almost, you know, whammy bar vibrato effect, which lends to the kind of slightly cowboyish uh, dystopian nightmare that I've just sung. These, uh, dystopian nightmares are all the rage these days. Kids love them. <coughs> so, that's the song, the Yes the Raven song, Breathe. Um, so, hopefully I'll be able to use some of these songs and covers um, and utilize them to talk about some of these more advanced uh, finger picking techniques and musical techniques. So, if you've got any questions, uh, drop them in the comment area. Um, if you're new to this, thanks for listening to All That Waffle. And uh, like and subscribe and click the wee bell. Um, I don't know if I pointed in the right direction, but definitely click the wee bell and uh, you'll get notified for future videos. Um, all right, I'll see you soon. Toodaloot.